Okay, next up we have Chris Voss, president of the California Abalone Association. Good afternoon. I'd like to start by thanking Kristen Bohr and Dan, Heather, Ariel, Josh, Sarah Valencia, Sarah Rathbone, Chris Costello, Steve Gaines, John Milak, and everyone else that uh, worked to make this um, whole presentation a possibility or a, a reality. Thank you. Um, also, I'd like to start here with a quote from um, the Nobel Committee when they um, were talking about the work of Eleanor Olstrom, who was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in economics. And uh, what they said was, her work shows that local communities often manage common resources, such as, such as wood, lakes, and fish stocks, better on their own than when outside authorities and police rule. And then Eleanor, ex explaining her own, the significance of her work, uh, this is a direct quote, said, bureaucrats sometimes do not have uh, the correct information while citizens and users of resources do. And I, I, I she won the Nobel Prize, and I feel like that's pertinent to this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> that's true. Uh, I, I think that um, there's a need to delegate authority um, within our system um, currently with the governor, the head of resources, uh, Department of Fish and Game, and the commission as the structure that deals with um, terrestrial and aquatic resources. There's a need to delegate the authority that they have down to the local level. And uh, the parallel that I like to use, because it's so obvious and so so critical to all of us um, in this room is that um, with the rest of our government, it's the governor, the legislature, it's um, the, the judiciary, the county, the city, and then in our case here in Santa Barbara, there's a harbor department. And every one of those organizations and institutions have authority that's been delegated down, starting with the federal government. So the point is that we're surrounded by working organizational structures that bring authority down to the local level that is what helps our society function successfully. And I think in the case of resource management, there's a gap between the Department of Fish and Game and the commission and the citizens that end up having direct contact and access to, to resources. So um, what can we do about that? And what, what, sh what things should we contemplate? And uh, in our effort, the CAA's effort, th this started, and I'll start with a, just a little personal story. The reason I got involved was we had a seminal meeting here of the, the California, before I was president of the California Avalon Association. We had an organizational meeting that brought everybody back together after nine and a half years or nine years of closure to discuss what is possible prior to the, the approval of the Abalone Recovery and Management Plan by the commission in 2005. And um, in that meeting, we, we agreed as a group to take an equal share of any future access. So um, that's a good starting point for moving forward with what is now evolved into a pretty um, sophisticated management approach. So I think um, that's described as a pretty big hurdle for anybody else trying to embrace um, these kinds of management ideas with existing fisheries. We don't have an existing fishery. Everybody that's um, a former abalone diver um, would be anxious, hasn't really felt like there could be a fishery in the future, would be anxious to um, share any future access evenly. It's kind of a compromise uh, on the part of um, a lot of the individuals within the community. So then um, the other seminal moment was when the concept of a cooperative struck home in that we were as a, an association um, not able to figure out how to hold all of our members 
kind of together as we, as we developed ideas about co-management and collaboration and, uh, and then funding some of our own activities, we, we, um, we tried to think in ways that how, how could we actually unite our organization in some meaningful fashion and hold everybody to a standard. And, um, and so the cooperative concept introduced to us by <coughs> Chuck Cook through Jill Sullivan turns into a, a light bulb situation. So embracing that as the appropriate democratic structure to move forward um, to, again, fill this gap between um, the Department of Fish and Game and, and the resource. And then what we found was that it's critical and what, what we found was successful in other situations was this need for a third entity. And in our case, we've embraced this institution, the Bren School, as our third entity, our scientific evaluation entity. It's going to help us to, at least from the assessment aspect of this, and then from the co-management perspective of a cooperative, hopefully collaborative obligation, if we can establish one with the state, um, we needed this balance. We needed a, no, a more scientific entity that would, that would help inform us moving forward. So the, what we've done is we've, we've worked to um, flush out some of the details that we would have to work out to create a cooperative, and then also reached out to the, this, this particular scientific institution to help us um, work through the details of a, of a, a co-management arrangement. Um, I think the one of the key pieces here is this idea of allocating the commercial uh, PAC, whatever amount of abalone, if it were determined um, safe to do to, to harvest, whatever amount that would be, that would be uh, allocated to the commercial, it would go entirely to the cooperative. So we would be responsible collectively for, um, for meeting an obligation that the state would spell out to actually receive that, um, receive that allocation. So it's a little bit different dynamic than when we were talking about enforcement and, and the need for accountability. If the allocation is going to the group, then, th then and, and, and this is a, another challenge here, through an MOU, MOUs and regulations that describe the nature of the relationship between the cooperative and the state, we can work out the details of, um, of how to hold us directly accountable for accomplishing a successful co-management arrangement, uh, arrangement, as well as meeting the economic needs of the state to um, manage the resource with us. So in the shared management arra arrangement, we're hoping to cut the cost to the state and then, in certain situations, reimburse the state for their own expenditures. And those, those kinds of um, details will be, will be worked out through these MOUs and this regu regulatory um, process. So um, I think that creates a slightly different dynamic than we've seen in the past. Um, And then if the allocation is made directly to the cooperative, then the cooperative is responsible for the details associated with quota shares to its members. And, and I think that um, it's, there's two really, to me, important char characteristics associated with that dynamic. And, and, and the one is that any cooperative member that has access to the resource by being a cooperative member, because that's the only way you're going to get access to the resource, is, is obligated to harvest their share. There is no leasing arrangement. I, I believe that there's this essential need for direct contact with the resource of, of all the people that would be involved in the, in the harvesting activity so that you don't get this detachment of, a, say, a lease, um, a lease relationship where I could lease my access to someone else. And in essence, dividing the population into two different groups, those that lease their 
access and those that physically drive their access, and then create um, diverging goals and objectives and incentives. So I think it's important that everyone's um, incentives be aligned, um, and, and, that, and one way of doing that is to require everyone to actually drive their access. And then the other, I think, critical characteristic is the need for an aggregation limit so that if we develop a consolidation mechanism, and like I said in the beginning, we all agreed to take an equal share, the cooperative would be open to anybody that had access to the resource when the fishery closed. The law states that, and that's what we're, 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 we're proposing as, as an idea. So we'll, be, we'll, we'll have everybody that used, was a former uh, Red Abilene diver uh, in the cooperative initially. And so there's a need for some sort of consolidation mechanism because we've been told by wise people that um, the 100 or so um, potential Abilene divers is, is an unworkable and unwieldy number for a cooperative to be successful. So we'll, we're working through the details of a consolidation mechanism that Chris, I think, is going to speak directly to in, in the next um, um, top topic here. So um, where was I? Um, so uh, with an aggregation uh, or a reduction, aggregation limit, meaning you, you can only hold so much, and then a goal of either everyone holding a similar amount as we reduce our numbers, or conceivably at some point during the process, you have varying amounts held by any one individual up to a cap. So nobody could come in and say, okay, I'm buying everybody's access, and, and it's all lumped into one person's hand or one entity's hand. So it's uh, an effort to try to keep it, and I call it a democratic distribution of access. It's just in order to, you know, make it possible for this whole process to continue on well into the future if we were able to, you know, establish it. So two things, aggregation limit and, uh, and then, um, and then another critical step that I think we have to take is we need to work out the details of conflict resolution. And I think in the MLMA review, they spoke directly to the need for, I mean, th there's, there's, there's two aspects of this. Let me, let me back up here. Um, there's, there's the enforcement of rules and regulations that the cooperative's going to have and be able to impose on its members. So that, again, is releasing some of the burden on the state. But then there'll be um, real serious violations that will still be in the hands of the state. If, if there's a need for uh, revoking someone's access for some egregious resource violation, that would, would of course, be uh, something that the state would um, deal with. But, but at, at the, at the co-op level, when it comes to making certain that logbooks are filled out accurately and, 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 uh, and on time, and, and the aspects of, of the details of collecting fisheries-related information, we can, we can assume that responsibility because within the MOU, I envision a very well-described report that we would have to generate at the end of every year that would have all these pieces of information that have to be included in, and there would be an, an accountability aspect to that. So, um, so then also, this is an interesting thing. Joe Sullivan made it clear that the co from a legal standpoint, the cooperative has the capacity to sanction its members. If you sign up to be a cooperative member, you're going to sign a, a, a document that states that these are your obligations, and, and then therefore you're, you're required to meet those obligations or will take steps. And I think we'll end up over time developing a kind of a precedent. If someone does this wrong, this is the, the consequence, and we'll end up creating some sort of mini legal system within our cooperative. Um, and, but then also, in order to, to um, I think at the, at the state level, we still need recourse um, with respect to the dynamic interaction between the university, the Department of Fish and Game, and the cooperative in developing any other 
key policy pieces. The, the thing, I, again, I want to emphasize that the reason this will work is because I believe everybody has the same goal and objective, and that is sustainable resource management. So resource first. The cooperative's goal is going to be clearly stated as the resource first. Obviously, this university's goal is that as well, and the department has a mandate to, to, to. So there's this pretty serious alignment of everyone's, um, of everyone's ob goals and objectives. So um, well I think I'll just wrap it up there. That's it. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes for questions now. Really nice. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, do we have a succession plan? Um, well, there's been discussion in our consolidation, how we get to a certain point, the workable point, that we would it then at that point have um, external transferability. So initially, from when we start to when we get to a capacity goal, like, and the numbers bandied around are, we'll start at 80, something like that, or 100, and we get to 35. At 35, um, between that transition, you, we're trying to work out a mechanism we can do it internally with the, either the co-op purchasing people, and that team, is, and that raises everybody's access, if the co-op can actually pur purchase people out of it, or having individuals within the co-op purchase each other. So to get to your question, if you can, ch if you ultimately get to the 35, you can bring new people in. And since you're required to harvest, if you can't physically anymore, you're forced to sell out because your access is no longer of any value to you other than to transfer out of it. So that's another reason why you would certainly want to um, keep it um, tight that you need to, to benefit, you have to get in the water. You have to put a wetsuit on, jump in the water. Okay, well, if there aren't any other questions, then we will move on. Thank you very much. <laughs>